In 2020, I decided at the beginning of the year that I wanted to get better at running. I wanted to be able to run farther and run longer. Uh, it was a new commitment to getting into shape and to losing weight, so I'm like, I'm gonna run. So I live in a neighborhood that one lap around my neighborhood is just a little bit more than a mile. So if I would do three laps, it would be exactly four miles. And I thought to myself, I'd love to run four miles. So you can imagine, I get the right gear, I grab my sneakers that have been hiding in the closet for several years, put my running clothes on and, and I tell my wife proudly I'm going for a run and, and she held back her surprise pretty good at that and said, well, good luck, you know, don't hurt yourself. And I go out on this run, I got my big cup of water and I'm like, I'm gonna do this thing. And I got around the first bend in my neighborhood and realized that I was completely out of breath. I couldn't take another step in my run. I had to stop and start walking again. I was so disappointed with myself that I didn't even make it halfway around my neighborhood before I was completely winded. And I remember setting in my mind, I want to make one lap without walking. So the next couple times that I ran, and it was kind of consistent every other day or so, I would try to get a little bit farther and a little bit farther until sure enough, I was able to run one complete lap, but there were still two more to go. So I'd run a lap and eventually I was running a lap, walking a lap and running a lap. And until I got to the place several months later where I, re I remember very distinctly running all three laps, all four miles without having to stop and without having to take a break. Now in my mind as I'm continuing to run that course on a weekly basis, I'm always trying to beat my last time and to go a little bit faster than I did before. I'll tell you what the key to that was, to having some success in that goal, was the rhythm, the consistent rhythm of trying to run on a regular basis. You know, rhythms are extremely important in our lives. Rhythms are instituted by God to help us grow deeper, to help us become stronger, not only physically, but also relationally and spiritually. And what we have just come through over the course of 2020 is that all of our rhythms have been interrupted. Our kids going to school, when and where we go to work, how we gather with our churches, all of it has been interrupted and we find ourselves floundering. And it's natural that we would, in this season, have struggles spiritually, physically, and emotionally. That's why we've decided as a church to take the next several weeks and to focus on the essential rhythms for growing our faith. What has God said to us about what we need to be doing and what we need to be doing regularly so that we can run farther spiritually than we did the day before, so that 2021 can be a stronger year and a growth year? What rhythms are essential in our lives? That's what we're going to look at this week and for the next uh, four weeks, and we hope that you'll join us as we do this. Maybe you've asked yourself this or you found yourself in this season saying things like, I wish I felt closer to God. I wish my family was closer to God. I wish I loved church. I wish my neighbors would get saved. I wish I, I felt better. I wish I could run farther. I wish I was more spiritually excited. You know, those are all natural questions, and and we're going to be trying to help each other do these things better. So what we're going to look at over the next four weeks is we're going to look at first today, rhythms for your soul. What can you do so that you can be closer to God and have a stronger connection with him? Then next week, we're going to look at rhythms for your family. How can you help your children? How can you help your spouse grow closer in, in your walk with God? Rhythms for your church. How can I be in love with church again? and then rhythms for your one. I know that there's somebody in your life that you would love to see connect with Christ, walk with Christ, and come to know Christ. Well, how do we make that happen? Rhythms are gonna be important in that. D.A. Carson said that people do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate towards godliness, prayer, obedience to scripture and faith and delight in the Lord. Listen, it is not natural for us to run towards holiness and to, to be regular prayers and, and to love 
uh, Bible reading, all of those things are unnatural. It's kind of like if you want to grow stronger, you need to be in the rhythm of actually lifting weight, of using your muscles. And when you don't do that weight lifting activity, when you don't use your muscles, you atrophy. You actually become weaker. You see, that muscle rhythm is important in strengthening your physical body. And just like that in our spiritual bodies, our spiritually strengthening rhythms are, are hard. They're not natural, but they're necessary so that we can become stronger. And just like our muscles, if we don't use them, we will gravitate away from holiness, godliness, prayer. Maybe you found yourself in this season having a difficult time praying. You might even be a little bit mad at God for what you're going through and how hard this past year has been. Maybe it's been difficult for you to read the Bible and to get into it and understand it and, and you, you found yourself just kind of distancing. Maybe for you, you've been away from your church and maybe for good reason, for health reasons, but it's been a distance and, and you're not sure when or how or why you would ever even be able to jump back in. Maybe you've been longing for the day that somebody you know would come to Jesus. He said, go and make disciples, but it just doesn't seem to be happening. These spiritual practices will all improve when you start in small ways, but consistent ways, rhythms of spiritual growth in your life. First Timothy chapter four, verses seven through 10 says this, train yourself for godliness for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds the promise for this present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for it is to this end that we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all the people, especially of those who believe. Listen, godliness is something we train for. It is hard work. We toil and we strive after it. And I know, like me, you probably don't look forward to that hard work. You probably don't look forward to that four-mile run that you can barely get through. But man, once you do it, once you've accomplished it, once you've gone in it and put the effort forward, you are so satisfied and gratified in the result. When we put the work into these spiritual rhythms, we will be extremely satisfied in the goodness that it causes in us, in the godliness that it springs forth. It gives us the ability to have the strongest and best life we can possibly have. This is work worth doing. These rhythms are valuable in the life of a believer. So over the next four weeks, as we look at these rhythms, as we look at rest for our soul, we're going to ask ourselves, how do I pray? And we're, we'll look at that today and follow that up with, can I read the Bible for myself? What if I wasn't able to gather with my church? What if the pandemic went, went farther? What if persecution started? Would I be able to pray and read the Bible for myself? Maybe, maybe this rhythm for your family is important and you've got kids or a spouse that you would love to see grow closer to God. How do I lead my kids in a relationship with Jesus? How do I help my spouse grow spiritually? What do we do in our home? That will cause us to be stronger and better with spiritual and relational things. Then we're going to look at the church and, and we're going to ask this extremely important question. What is the church? And, and listen, most people get that answer wrong. Then we're going to say, how can I love God and love my church? I meet a lot of people that say they love God, but they do not like church. And there are a lot of reasons for that. But can you love God and not love his church? Can you love God but not love his bride? And how do we love the church? And, and matter of fact, make it something that we can't live without. And we're going to talk about how we can be more giving in all of that and be more generous. And then as we look at this last rhythm of, of your one, we want to talk about when your one will get saved. And in, in my world, in my life, in my spirit, there is nothing more exciting than seeing someone you know come to Christ. As someone you know, start a relationship with Jesus because you know how awesome it is to be a follower of Jesus. And today, if you're listening with us and, and you're on a spiritual journey and you're not quite sure who God is, you're not quite sure if you're in on this spiritual stuff and praying in the church and, and reading the Bible, you don't know if you, you're, you even believe that. 
Today, I want to invite you to, to peek into the life of a believer and the rhythms of faith. And, and understand that these faith rhythms, because of a belief in Jesus, are transformational and they provide life and life more abundantly. If you don't yet know Jesus, if you have not yet given your life to Christ, I hope that these rhythm discussions will encourage you to begin that relationship. He is calling you to himself and God wants to give you the tools that you need to be able to excel physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And it all starts with a personal faith in the Lord Jesus. If you have any questions about that, you can go to our website at any time at branchlife.church and click on that gospel tab and we'll talk to you exp uh, specifically about how you can become a follower of Jesus. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, I appeal for, to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may able, be able to discern what God's will is, his good and acceptable and his perfect will. Listen, this renewal of our mind that causes us to change, that causes us to transform, doesn't happen by accident. Faith rhythms are essential to the renewal needed for transformation. Are you ready for change? Are you ready for growth? Are you ready for the most exciting year ever, for the stronger relationships to be able to know and feel God's presence? Then lean in to this series as we talk about the rhythms that are essential for a strong faith and a successful year ahead. Thanks for joining us today, guys. We're going to talk to you in just a little bit more about rhythms for your soul. But let's begin by worshiping together. Well, as we launch into this first Sunday on rhythms, we want to talk to you specifically about rhythms for your soul. We're going to focus today on those spiritual practices that, that help you in your personal relationship with God. Listen, God is not some far off being that's kind of released us to do our own thing. He's someone who wants a personal connection with us on a daily basis. He has, you have the opportunity to be best friends with God to be, to be uh, led by the Savior, to be able to have a close relationship with God as your Father. And, but I wouldn't be surprised if, as you're listening to this day, to this today, you might be in that place where you feel like God is far off, where you feel like he's a little bit out of reach. Maybe, maybe going through the difficulties of this year has caused you to have a little bit of, of distance with God. Maybe you found yourself in the broken rhythms of what's happened to us over the course of the last year to be able uh, to, to have been distracted from your relationship with God. And if, if that's you, I, I would say, hey, that's natural. That's, that's to be expected. And it's going to take intentional and specific effort for you to decide to become closer to God. So in these next few moments, we want to look at the rhythms for your soul that'll help you feel closer to God, that'll help you with a stronger connection to Christ so that, so that God is no longer distant, but he's, he's connected, he's real, and you will be able to feel his love, to know his power, and to be just inspired by that relationship with God again. Remember that moment when you first accepted Jesus as your personal savior, when you decided to become a follower of God, and there, there's a flood of emotions and feelings that come up in that, in that first season of knowing God. It's, it's an intimate relationship. He, he's making a lot of difference. You can't wait to spend time with him. Your soul longs after him. If you've lost that, if that has, if that has become distant or routine, let's talk about some rhythms that are going to help you feel that again, that closeness to God. In James chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of James together for a little bit. At the end of James, we're going we're gonna to see this incredible encouragement that it gives us. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. I want to stop and think about that for a second. There's, there's a two dual reality that's happening in this verse. Number one, it says, submit yourselves to God. God is real. God, God is giving us instructions. He's, he's given us commands. He's given us direction. And God says, hey, submit to me. 
I, I, I want you to follow me. I, I want you to be a part of my kingdom and I, I will be your king. But the dual reality that is equally real is that the devil also exists. And the last thing that the devil wants is for you to submit yourself to God. The devil is actively pursuing ways that he can interrupt your spiritual rhythms. The last thing the devil wants is for you to have a close walk and relationship with the Lord. So James says in this verse, and this book is one of my favorite books of the Bible, James says very clearly, listen, you've got a choice. And, and what you need to do is you need to submit yourself to God and resist the devil. And when you do that, God becomes closer and the devil becomes farther. Let's look at this verse again. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And here's a promise that is powerful. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So what are those faith rhythms that cause us to draw near to God? Let's look at Jesus first as one of our examples. In Luke chapter 5, we see this example, and it's repeated over and over again in the gospel. Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness to pray. Jesus loved to talk to God. When Jesus was feeling distant, when Jesus was under pressure, when Jesus was in the midst of the turmoil, he would slip away to the wilderness to pray. He would go and have a meeting with God. I can't think of any way better to draw near to someone than to have a conversation. And here's two parts to a conversation. A conversation is one, talking. I'm gonna to talk to you and we're gonna have a conversation. Or two, and two, listening. Hearing the other person talk. So how do you draw near to God? Well, there's two very important steps. Number one, you've gotta to talk to God. And Jesus showed us by example that prayer is the way we talk to God. We tell God about our day, about our lives. We ask him questions. We explain things that we need. We praise him. We, 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 we wrestle with him. We argue with him sometimes. And prayer is that conversation piece that is necessary for us to grow closer to God. We have to talk to God on a regular basis. Yet so many of us find it so difficult to pray. But prayer is one of those powerful things things that we need in our life. And the second part of the conversation that we're going to look at in just a little bit is hearing God talk. And God talks to us through his word. He's written us a love letter that we call the Bible. And it allows us to have this ongoing conversation. So Jesus gives us this example of slipping into the wilderness and look at it over and over again in the New Testament. Jesus praying and talking to God and instructing us on how to pray. But Jesus uh, Jesus loved God. And, and let me just challenge you with this. Show me someone who loves God and I'll show you someone who loves to pray. Listen, you can't love God and not love prayer. You can't love a person and not want to talk to them as much as possible. Imagine if I said I love my wife, but I never talked to her. That would be strange. That would be weird. That would be unnatural. But when you love God, when your heart is connected with God, when you're walking in the spirit of God, you are going to love prayer. And in my life, there have been examples of prayers that have been an encouragement to me, a challenge to me, a blessing to me. And we've seen people who love God, love to pray, have an incredibly powerful influence, not only over their lives, but on the lives of others because of their powerful prayer life. I think in the Bible, back to the person of Daniel. Daniel was a young man who was kidnapped from his home, talked about uncertain times. And he was taken and he, he began a regular rhythm as a young teenager of prayer. And the Bible says that even when he had become successful, even if he had become one of the commanders, one of the rulers of one of the greatest empires of all time, he had this regular rhythm of praying three times a day. He would go to a window, he would kneel down, and he would have a conversation with God. Daniel's incredible success, Daniel's favor with God and with other people was directly tied to his personal rhythm of prayer. Daniel loved God, and Daniel loved to pray. So from Daniel and from other instructions in Scripture, how do we pray? Well, let me just encourage you with a couple of thoughts, and some of these come right out of the Lord's Prayer in the book of Matthew 
First, we, we praise him for who he is. Did you know that songs are prayer? Often when we're singing songs, we are singing to God. It is a form of prayer. Not every prayer has to be head bowed and eyes closed. Uh, you don't want to drive a car and start having a prayer with your head bowed and your eyes closed. You can talk to God in lots of different ways. And so we praise him for who he is. Hallowed be thy name. We thank him for what he has done. God makes it possible for us to even enter into his presence and have this connection. Man, I'm going to thank God for that. When you just praise him for who he is and thank him for what he's done, you're going to find that your time, your prayer time is going to fly by. We can tell him about what we need. The Bible says to ask him this day for our daily bread. And so when we talk to God about our needs, about our desires, about our wants. We can talk to him about others. And, and for, for people who have a regular pattern of prayer, this idea of praying for other people is so extremely important and it's so extremely appreciated by others. When you tell someone that you're praying for them and you actually do it, man, it is a powerful, powerful way to bring God into the conversation, to bring God into the circumstances, to bring God into those moments. And prayer is one of the most incredible things that you can do for another person. So just if you don't know what else to do, just start talking to God about other people. And that's a great way to pray. We can ask him for wisdom. And the Bible says if you ask for wisdom, God will give it to you. What do I do? How do I do it? Where do I go from here? How do I feel closer to you? God, show me and he will give it to you. And another great powerful tool of prayer is just being still. Be still. And know that he is God. And sometimes I enter into his presence and I don't even have the words to say. But the Bible says that the Holy Spirit prays for me. In those moments, I can just be still. And sometimes one of the most powerful things you can do in prayer is to be still before God. In James chapter 4, we see an incredible passage that where we learn about the power of prayer. And this, this passage, uh, when we read it, just allows us to, to clearly see who God is. Excuse me, James chapter 5. In James chapter 5, starting in verse 13, it says, Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, Confess your sin to one another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power and is working. This passage goes on to tell us about Elijah who prayed literally for it to stop raining. And it stopped raining. This practice or rhythm of prayer is essential in growing close to God. Look in this verse every time. It talks about communicating with God through prayer, through confession, through song. God has instructed, God has implemented this very natural, very important rhythm of prayer into our lives so that we can grow closer to God. At Branch Life Church, we like to value prayer through this statement, pray first. If you don't know how to pray, if prayer is not a regular part of your life, how do you get started in this rhythm? Well, let me tell you, just pray first. Whatever's happening at the beginning of your day, pray first. Whenever you have a decision to make, pray first. Whenever you're going to talk with somebody and you're not sure where, what to say, pray first. You're thinking about buying a new car. You're trying to write a song. You're trying to figure out who, if you should ask that person out on a date or not. Pray first. You're getting ready to play a game. You're getting ready to, to, to witness to your one. You're getting ready to help your kids with their homework. Pray first. We think that prayer is such a powerful, powerful tool that it's the first thing that we should do whenever we have the chance. So at Branch Life Church, we've created this tool, a, a Pray First booklet. And if you would like this, you can let us know on our website. You can put it in your comment card. I'd like to have a Prayer First journal. We have online versions of this. But we give this to you so that you can have a day in and day out tool to assist you in your prayer life. And so would you start the rhythm or restart the rhythm of prayer? And if this journal can be a help to you, you can grab one by letting us know at branchlife.church or on your comment card or your connection card. So do you have a prayer story? 
It's, a, it's an interesting question, and I, I ask it because I want to remind us of the power of prayer. For me, over the course of the last few years, prayer has become a rhythm that's become more essential in my life than ever before. I've been, pray, I've been saved for a long time, well over 30 years. And in those 30 years, I've had good seasons of prayer and bad seasons of prayer. And three years ago, when God launched us on this journey to start Branch Life Church, he, he basically was asking us to step off a cliff. We didn't know where we were going or how we were going to get there. He just said, trust me. And I, I know specifically that God was working to make prayer a powerful part of this. And so the first thing that we decided to do as a church was to build a prayer team. And our goal for that prayer team is to have a thousand people praying for us on a regular basis. And we cherish our prayer team members. Right now, we have eight, over 800 active prayer team members who receive a regular email and pray for Branch Life Church. You can sign up for that also at branchlife.com, or excuse me, branchlife.church. But that prayer team, those, those moments where we didn't know what was going to happen, how God was going to provide, where we were going to meet, when, when there was huge questions and huge challenges, not the least of which being a giant pandemic in the first year of existence, prayer has been the secret. Writing those emails and being able to hit send and knowing that 800 people could be praying for those requests, for those challenges, for those opportunities brought incredible peace. And there are things that we cannot explain as a church, humanly speaking. What God has done, how God has done it. Over the course of the last few weeks, in the midst of a pandemic, we met our year-end giving, year giving goal. Our goal was $50,000 in the month of December, and God has provided more than that. We are now standing on a property that, that has been donated to Branch Life Church. How does that happen? The team is growing. People are coming to Christ in the midst of a pandemic. We, we don't understand it other than to say, people have been praying. Prayer is powerful, and this regular rhythm of prayer has been essential in our lives. What's your prayer story? What is the thing that you're praying about or you've seen that has happened that can only be explained through prayer? Would you share that with your worship site? Would you share that with your small group this week? Would you share that with your family over dinner? Would you write a story and post that online for others to hear? And, and do you have a prayer rhythm? What is your prayer rhythm? And if you don't have a prayer rhythm, if you just kind of pray out of whim or when it's convenient, may I encourage you to establish a prayer rhythm in 2021, a regular practice of prayer. Daniel did it when he prayed three times a day. That might not be your rhythm, but there, it's important that you have a rhythm of prayer. Lastly, as we finish our discussion today, I want to say this, show me someone who knows God and I'll show you someone who knows the Bible. Man, if you want to know God and know God more, if you want to know his character, his will, his plan, well, then you've got to know his word. And it's not enough to depend on just some preacher giving you some stuff for an hour on Sunday mornings. You've got to be able to feed yourself. Hey, one meal a week might help you get by, but three meals a day is essential. And and spiritually speaking, we need this food of God's word. Look at Psalm 119. This is the longest psalm in the Bible, and it's all about God's word. Look at this section from Psalm 119, starting in verse 7. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation day and night. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. I hold my, back my feet from the evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than the honey. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I'll tell you what, there's nothing better than having the guidebook to life. That God's words have been made real to you, that he can talk to you at any moment in any day. His word is alive and well, and it's a love letter that God has written to you. Let's read it. Let's read it together when we get together in our families, in our groups, when we are together as a church. Our commitment at Branch Life Church is that every time we are gathered together, when we worship together, we're going to look at God's words and see what God has to say to us. 
And God has built the rhythm of his word into our lives. It's a conversation that we must keep happening. So you have, might be asking yourself, I tried reading the Bible. I just, it's too much for me. It's too long. I don't know where to start. It's an intimidating book. So here's the question. Can I read the Bible for myself? And, and let me give you some incredible news. Absolutely, you today can read the Bible for yourself. And God has made it incredibly accessible for you to know God's word. Look at James chapter 1. Remember I said we'd be in James together today. Flip back over to James chapter 1. And we're going to start looking in verse 22 of James chapter 1. It says this, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like a man that looks into a mirror, and once he looks at himself, he goes away and forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in what he's doing. Now here's the good news from this particular verse. Reading God's word is as simple as looking in a mirror. I mean, if you can look in a mirror, you can read God's word. God's word is not a mystery book. God's word is not some high flutin academic textbook. God's word is a letter. It's a reflection that he has given you. And you are able to simply connect to God by reading these words. And I guarantee that if you start and you persevere, you look intently, you investigate what you're looking at, that God's words will come alive in your soul. This passage gives us three steps that we can take to know God's word together. And there are three very simple steps. So if you're struggling to know God's word and read God's word, I want you to think about these steps. And they come right out of verse 25. In verse 25, it says this, But the one who looks in the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being not a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in what he's doing. So God has given us a roadmap of how to read his word, and here's what it is. But the one who first looks, the first thing that we need to do whenever we come to God's word, is we simply need to look at it. We just have to read it. The power of observation and when you read the Bible like any other book, you're looking for what's there. What's the characters? What's the plot? What's the scenery? Who's here? Who's this about? What's going well? What's going poorly? And as you read God's word, you will, through the characters and through the instructions and through the commandments, be able to see what God is saying. But in order to do it, you simply have to start with looking. You're not going to get anywhere at knowing the Bible if you don't read it. So start by simply reading. And I want to encourage you to look at what's there and make these observations. We don't have time in today's discussion to go in depth into these steps. But sometime in the near future, here at Branch Life Church, we're going to be offering an equipped class on how to study the Bible. And we're going to look deeper into these three steps. So be on alert. And let us know if you're interested in getting the information for that class. It'll probably be a virtual class that you can take at your own pace. And we'll go deeper into all of these. And we got some great hints for you about how to read, how to look at the Bible. But the second thing this passage says to do is it says not just to look at the perfect law, the law of liberty, but to persevere. And so the second step is to simply think about it. You've got to think about what you're looking at. You've got to, the Bible says, interpret it. You've got to understand it. And the best way that I know how to give you advice about how to persevere is to ask questions and get answers. Have you ever met a good question asker? When you're sitting across the table from someone and they just are able to ask great questions that keeps the conversation going, that's an incredibly good skill to have when you read the Bible. What is God teaching me? What characters are present? What words are repeated over and over again? What kind of book am I reading? Who has written this book? And when you start asking those questions and going after answers, you're in this second part of this step of reading the Bible. Not only are you looking at it, but now you're thinking about it. And you're trying to uncover the truth, the truth principles that are there. And, and just like we're looking at this passage, we're seeing truth about God's instructions for us at looking at his word. And God gives you these truths 
to guide your life. Each and every Sunday that we're together, we highlight these truth principles out of God's Word. And we hope that it's a pattern that you can follow. When we read God's Word, we think about it, and we look at the truth. When you read God's Word, you think about it, and you look at the truth. This will be a powerful rhythm in your life. And then thirdly, as we go on with the verse, you first you look at it, then you think about it. But not just someone who hears it and forgets, but be a doer who acts. If you want to be someone who is successful at the rhythm of reading God's word, you don't just read it and then ignore it. You read it and the third step is extremely important. You do it. You put it into practice. When God says, don't take the Lord's name in vain, then you say, I'm not going to take the Lord's name in vain. When God says not to look lustfully on a woman, I'm not going to look lustfully on a woman. When God says to act with integrity and to be honest, then you're going to choose integrity and honesty. When God says, hey, gather together as a church, we're going to gather together, even if it has to be virtually. When we see God's commandments and God's instructions, we then put them into practice. He says to look, to think, and to do his word. So that is exactly what we're going to do as a church. And this rhythm is going to help you as an individual. And your spiritual great growth, your spiritual life, will ignite into a bonfire of faith if you would regularly look at, think about, and then do God's word. It's transformational. I want you to test me on this. I want you to go through 2021 committed to the rhythm of reading God's word. We're going to be committed to it as a church on Sundays. We're going to study through an entire book of the Bible in 2021. And we want to encourage you to do the same thing, to read the Bible for yourself, to read it in your groups, and to be a part of our studies together as a church. Would you implement this rhythm in a brand new way in 2021 and see what God does? So the question that we have to ask is, do you have a Bible reading rhythm? For both Bible reading and prayer, let me leave you with this simple advice. How do I put this rhythm into my life? Well, I want to encourage you to set a time, to set a place, and to set a plan. Over the course of the next few days, would you pray and ask God to help you set a time to pray, to read his Bible, to set a place to, to play and read his Bible, and to set, have a plan for prayer and Bible reading. You know, Daniel prayed three times a day at the window and, and with intentionality. That was part of Daniel's rhythm. So what is your rhythm? Maybe it's every time I lay down to go to bed, I, every time I lay down in my bed, I'm going to pray for five minutes. That's a plan. That's a rhythm. You can do that. Maybe you're a morning person and you're going to get up, grab a cup of coffee at the kitchen table and read through a Bible reading plan for the year. Maybe you're going to get together with your spouse in the living room every other Tuesday. It doesn't matter what the rhythm is. It just matters that you have a rhythm. And that this rhythm causes you to grow closer in your relationship with God. I want to encourage you to investigate a lot of resources that are out there. We'll highlight some of these on our social media, in our emails over the next couple of weeks. But there are lots of 2021 Bible reading plans. You can get a part of a Bible study program. Literally look up the Bible study and you can get a hold of this resource to study the Bible for yourself. And I've encouraged teenagers and adults alike to use on-track devotions. These devotions simply use the look, think, do questions to help you study the Bible for yourself. These are designed for teens, but I use them for myself. They're just a great way to get into God's Word. If you go to ontrackdevotions.com, you can find more information about all of these things. Hey, we are excited to talk more about next week about rhythms that are going to impact your family. So I want to encourage you to join that for us today. But before you go, will you take a couple of moments and fill out your connection card? On that card, you can, you can let us know what your rhythms are or what rhythms you are planning to implement for prayer or for Bible study. Or you can ask us to pray as you seek out what God would have you to do. But let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know that you participated in online worship today. And if you have any questions about spiritual rhythms, ask them on that card and we might even be able to answer that 
and one of these future worship sessions together. If you have any questions about the gospel, we want to encourage you again to go to branchlife.church and to go to the gospel tab. If you're not sure about your personal relationship with Jesus, we would love to have that conversation with you there. And if you're ready to begin the walk with Jesus, you can do that now uh, in the quietness of these moments wherever you are and begin the most essential rhythm, and that's walking by faith with Jesus Christ. And then join us next week as we jump into rhythms that are essential for your family. Thank you guys so much for being with us. Let me close in a word of prayer. God, as we looked at these rhythms today, will you allow the rhythms of prayer and Bible study to dominate our relationship with you? God, help us not to be distracted from these or allow these to wander out of our lives. But God, will you ignite a fire for this regular conversation with you to take place? Help us, God, to talk to you regularly through prayer and hear, hear from you regularly through your word in our lives so that we can excel through the year ahead. Thank you, God, for these powerful rhythms that change our soul. In your precious name we pray. Amen.